All right, good afternoon, guys. And so um, I have a paper today that is thinking about uh, how to teach controls, basically, uh, alternative hypotheses. Um, it took a while to get there, but once it got there, I thought there were some interesting uh, things to say about it. Uh, before we get there, though, let me uh, sort of check in with you guys and see where you are, uh, as we were just talking about. So, Nick, we'll start with you, sort of where are you at in terms of uh, the semester, but also maybe some of the active learning stuff you've been doing. Yeah, so for the semester, we're doing pretty well for the uh, course. We um, Our active learning stuff was, <clears throat> excuse me, was mostly focused on the first half of the semester as we went through um, it's a plant pathology class. So as we went through the different categories of plant disease, like bacteria, funguses, viruses, nematodes, abiotic stresses. And so for us, it was kind of concentrated on the first half of the semester. And what we found is that students really liked the exercises. They thought they were really fun, really helpful. Their complaints were is that the, because um, it was for us, okay, we talked about bacteria sort of stuff how would you diagnose an unknown disease for bacteria? So we gave them worksheets of different possible bacterial diseases of corn, for instance. And then at home, they went through symptoms, signs, how to tell if it's this or that. <clears throat> and then in class, we gave uh, each group a, a worksheet with um, images and like a scenario of unknowns. And then they tried to work through what the disease was, what led them to their answer. And they thought that sometimes our unknowns were too easy. So <clears throat> I was pleasantly surprised by that because yeah, seriously, wow. most of the time I figure for them, I'm like, well, it's going to be pulling teeth to get them to try to do anything. But they, they did a lot better than I anticipated. They were really engaged throughout all of it. The one thing that didn't work super well is that I found that it was a struggle for them to then keep up to watch the actual the lecture that we kind of substituted for this activity to watch that at home, which of course was already recorded and stuff, but for them to keep up with that instead of you know coming to class and being forced to hear me talk about stuff, they struggled a little bit keeping up with that and ended up piling up towards the first exam. <clears throat> and so a lot were not quite as prepared for the exam as they could have been. So, so I don't know, one other option that we have is that we always in the <clears throat> in the lab there's always a period of lecture before we do our lab exercises so one thing we thought about was to do these um, unknown kind of case studies in the lecture portion of the lab before we actually do lab activities because we have a little bit more fluidity um, with that uh, time block um, so that's something we're contemplating moving forward with since um, it was it was a bit of a struggle for them to keep up with the actual just course material when we did it this way, but they all actually really they went above and beyond what I thought they would for doing the activities and so I was pleasantly surprised by that. So with respect to them actually taking an interest in the material, maybe wanting to get more exposure to it that sounded pretty successful. Yeah, and they actually wanted they said, you know, even when we did this in class we had an extra 10 minutes. Why don't we do you know two unknowns instead of just one unknown? And I did not anticipate that. <clears throat> That's awesome. So I was, yeah, very happy that they want to do a little bit more as opposed to a little bit less. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and Dina, how is it in your end? Oh, things are good. Um, I do. I mean, I've been doing like I probably do seventy-five percent of every class is active learning and has been that way for years. But um, currently one of the things I, I'm working on that's that's different is um, in the past I would give them some sort of an activity to do and then they would turn it in and it would get graded. And now, and I would you know walk around the classroom and help them whatever. But now what I'm doing is I'm having them um, turn it in for feedback and then they revise and then they turn it in for grade. And I think that is helping um, because it's, um, we, we um, get them to correct some of those misconceptions and just conclusions that they have earlier. And also um, kind of gives them more of a growth mindset, I think that, you know, we're here to learn. We're not here to get 
just get a grade, but um, it's a lot of work <laughs> to do that. I was just about to think like you're doing more grading, but there's the benefit. Yeah. <laughs> um, and in theory, the grading is easier after they've revised it. Um, so um, there's less, you know, how much partial credit do I give or whatever. It's just, I think, hopefully got it, got it all right or they just didn't bother. So it's kind of been pre-graded. That's going pretty well. Um, I, had, I do have a learning assistant who helps me with that, giving all the feedback. Um, that's cool and i think we've talked about that before the uh how you uh select a learning assistant and uh ways you can make sure that you're getting a getting a good quality experience with that individual so yeah and i, I think that is a really good use of the learning assistant that to give this feedback um so i like it nice we're just uh, transitioning here. You were at a question, Nick. I'm sorry. No, oh, no, I, I, I didn't. I was just kind of, and just in general, though, I did wonder um, what uh, kind of classes um, do both of you teach? I mm -hmm. teach a, a micro class for non-majors, a really big lecture class, a plant pathology class with a lab for uh, majors and non-majors, and then a, <clears throat> a freshman micro class, which is from the, the Howard Hughes program, C-Phages, yep. the Phage Discovery one. We're, we're familiar with it, yeah. And that's pretty cool. <laughs> Where are you at? I'm at uh, Iowa State. Oh, OK, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I teach, um, I'm teaching intro bio right now. Um, and it's the sort of cells and molecules half of the course. And um, I teach genetics as well. And not this semester, and I teach um, I teach a, an upper level human genetics class that's writing intensive. And I teach intro bio lab as well as the lab. So I'm, I'm also a molecular biologist by trade. So do the intro, do the genetics. Um, uh, I have an advanced class in cellular molecular and um, I am moonlighting as a neurobiologist this semester just because of some, neuro, or neuro, some uh, hiring issues that we've had. That'll get resolved in August, which is lovely. Um, but uh, mostly the cellular stuff. So I was just about to say we're at the point now in the semester. Um, I've tried a couple different things with the genetics class I teach every spring and I had put off um, I put off what I'd normally done to later with respect to uh, teaching primary lit. And so I've got my students uh, reading a scientific paper right now. And there's lots of competing schools of thought out there about how best to do that. Um, and I am um, having them go through and look at individual figures right now and uh, doing my best uh, to get them comfortable uh, with the the process, as you guys are very familiar with. <laughs> I saw something that was kind of cool related to that. As I was looking through Jimby for um, just a variety of the different like tips and tools versus yeah, <laughs> like case study um, papers. And there was a cool tips and tools one that I thought was kind of neat in which, you know, in textbooks, they have the little like boxes that like a case study and they tell you, you know, a little bit about someone's thing. And it was to have students go and you give them a research paper and they come up with their own little case study box, or whatever. It was kind of neat. I thought that was kind of a cool, simple idea. Okay. So, here is the paper. And what this paper was about was trying to think about getting students to understand confounding variables. And they sort of, they kept interchanging the terms confounding factors and controls in here. Um, and the goal was to basically validate that there was a, an active learning based process by which one could improve student perception of experimental controls and the purpose of experimental controls and using some different scenarios um, to extract the information they wanted to extract. And so this is done across a couple different institutions. 
uh, Dominican, Uver Dominican University and the University of Chicago, uh, both of which are in uh, the greater Chicago area, obviously. And um, having both um, a big research university and a small liberal arts college with a very um, substantial underrepresented population present in it uh, to look at the uh, potential contributions that those um, are gonna make. Okay. Um, there's some pretty philosophical underpinnings here. Uh, they talk a lot about scientific inquiry and the nature of science as they're setting the table for what it is they're going to do. And again, the goal is to get people to think more about what controls are and the purpose controls serve. This is done through the use of an active learning framework, which is what brings it more into our sphere. The paper itself does not talk a lot about the framework itself. I actually pulled the supplemental data uh, so we can take a look at it here. That, that was something I found unfortunate about this particular article. Um, I've published a bunch of stuff in Jimby, so I know there can be the um, ceilings on how many words you can write, but it just seemed that seemed an awfully important thing to relegate completely to the supplemental data um, was what actually happened in uh, the intervention. All of that said though, um, the idea here was to develop validated, or sorry, validated assessment tools here, a close-ended technique and an open-ended technique. So the idea would be to present the students with the question about a drug or a question about an everyday product and simply ask them with no other point of reference, um, is the drug or the product effective? And not give them an open-ended answer, um, have them pick between effective, someone effective, don't know, someone ineffective or ineffective. Then you would allow an open-ended response, is the drug effective, but then explain the answer in writing. And then finally, simply flat out ask what is a control or a controlled experiment and get the open-ended answers as well. And then they describe mostly in the supplemental data um, what coding they did to try to ascertain the answers they got for the open-ended questions. Um, the entire framework that they want you to appreciate is the idea of testing alternative hypotheses. And those of us that are teaching, it sounds like we're all teaching some form of introductory level students. Um, the idea of building science around a framework of taking hypotheses and ruling out uh, certain ones, sort of restricting down what you have, certainly a valid way to do it. And so this paper at its core is arguing for that mode of instruction as one that is to be favored. Right. So with all of that as the setup, you get into the actual intervention. Well, first of all, the pretest data, and then finally, what happened after the intervention. I think I'll show you a set of the data here, and then we'll uh, go over and look at how they actually did the intervention in the class. Um, just to remind you what we're looking at here, the University of Chicago and Dominican University. University of Chicago is a research institution. It's not any old research institution. It happens to be a very selective one. And so you're going to get students that are probably very well prepared for the undergraduate coursework they're gonna be taking. And then we have Dominican University. As you see here, 61% of the students are from some kind of Hispanic or uh, Latinx background. And so you're gonna have some very different um, setups. Go ahead. Oh, oh, I was responding to my own feedback, sorry. Uh, two varieties of introductory level courses at the University of Chicago, one for majors, one for non-majors. And at the PUI, just like at my PUI, we lump them all together into one big class. So they use their university registrar to sort of put people into different groups in the uh, one size fits all class to make sure that there's no difference between what one section is going to get in terms of a uh, mean student achievement, GPA, things like that versus another. So if we skip down here to the actual results, there we go. And so 
this is the scientific scenario question. So basically here's a drug and is the drug effective? And what they did was they took the somewhats and they lumped them in with the extremes. And so we've got three categories to consider. Is it effective, is it not effective, or do you not know? Uh, remember that no controls were presented here. And so they want to see don't know as the answer. And so you look at the PUI, you look at the R1 results for non-majors as the R1 results for majors. And the first things you see is that being a major didn't really make that much of a difference in the answer. Um, Almost like a little Dunning-Kruger effect for the people uh, that are doing science. Yeah, people. we've certainly seen that before, yes. Um, and the take home from this particular figure is that you're not seeing a difference. I can look at pre, I can look at post, um, and I'm not seeing any variation, at least any significant variation in terms of how the students are answering this question. If they believed a control or if they believed the drug to be ineffective at the beginning, they believed it to be ineffective at the end and vice versa. Yeah. This, I, I was really confused. Is this figure without any intervention? Is that right? It? Okay. Yeah, we haven't gotten to the intervention yet. Somewhere in the that, that part of the methodology is one thing that I was kind of wondering about, and <clears throat> perhaps both of you might have had similar experiences. When I proposed to our IRB um, panel before to do something with an intervention or with not. They've been pretty skeptical, skeptical of allowing me to do it, suggesting that if I think something will be a benefit to their learning, then I can't not give that to the control group. And so I was kind of, I was kind of surprised by that. It didn't seem like that was even a problem for them. It, it, have either of you come across that as something that when you try to do something that they are not favorable about that? I have not, but not sure. it is an interesting um, issue. And I think in this case, or you know, depending on the situation, you could potentially argue, we don't know if this is going to be beneficial. That's why we're doing the experiment. Um, and you know, we don't have the evidence, but if you're if you're following a best practice already, then you do have a pretty good idea. But if you're doing something that's kind of brand new, then um, I could, I, I think you could make the argument that we, we don't know. But then when you go to do it a second time, you can't do it a second time because you're already not, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. I know- That they, was my uh, argument with them too, but they were still kind of pushed back on it. I eventually was able to do it, but I was kind of surprised. I'm like, well, I don't have the data. How do I know? It could be worse for them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know somebody who did, there was a study where they found that whoever sits in the front of class does best. And it doesn't matter if they were assigned there randomly or they chose to sit there, whatever. If you sit in the back of the class, you don't do well if you sit in the front of the class. But you can't, knowing that, that there is some evidence for that, you can never redo that experiment because you can't just like, find out is, is this is this true or not because you don't want to um, penalize students by putting them in the back of the class and giving them that experience you know? so it's tough so this is probably a good uh, transition point can you guys see the supplemental materials here uh, I can yeah. see I can see the screen you're sharing yeah, yeah. thank you because I, I did not pull it down and look at it so. So Dina, can you see this on the screen? Okay, good. Because I just I just switched the tab and I can never remember like when I have to like go out and back in and when I can just do this. So there's actually a bunch of interesting stuff in here. Um, you actually, first of all, here are the prompts. Um, so actually very specifically, um, this is what they actually asked the students. So a migraine pill, 1,873 people with moderate to severe migraines nearly all has significant symptoms decrease within two to five hours is the pill effective. So there you go. Um, here's the everyday life prompt about scrambled eggs and uh, the particular butter they use to make scrambled eggs light and fluffy. And then the post question, basically the same, but it's an arthritis instead of a um, migraine. 
do do the people when they're asked the scenarios, did they tell them? I mean, I would assume if I just read that offhand, I would assume they did the controls and they're just reporting the significance to me. Yeah, I mean, I guess there's the danger. Like we've discovered this with some of the assessments we've tried to do, like the context in which you present um, you present them is super important. Like, I think you just, you have to emphasize this is all we're telling you. Yeah. Which is and dangerous that, because then you can sort of bias the answer, right? <clears throat> yeah, I thought that was difficult though. When I was thinking about how they're asking students and like, and then when I saw that, it makes me wonder, the real life scenario is a little easier for people to reason that, oh, I've done this before. I know you have to do this or do that. But when you're just given data, perhaps from someone that's an authority, I think many people just assume that what you're giving <coughs> the bullet point of what's important, not all the superfluous details. And I do appreciate that sort of extra thought they made that the everyday scenario <laughs> might exactly present itself exactly like you described, Nick, is somewhat different um, than what the scientific data would present itself as. And you'll see when we go back to the data, it does seem to make a difference in terms of how they're receiving the information. It may be so, that using real life scenarios though might be a way to to begin the process and saying, okay, in this real life scenario, what part of this would be your control? And then let's apply it to something else. I thought that might be a cool way to start off with a very low stakes, we've all made scrambled eggs before sort of example. Something to at least like, ease them into the situation. Like you'll yeah, make them really the think about what are you thinking about when you know we're talking about scrambled eggs. Now, if we move it to science, you know, what's what do we still need to have in our experiments? So I thought that was kind of a cool finding, really. So here's the intervention itself. And so they're talking about the elimination of alternative hypotheses and the way in which that can be done. And you see here, they're talking about experimental design, but also on a more macro level about um, ways that one can assess sort of large scale phenomenon. And so you see here the modules that they choose to use and you get a sense here of trying to present big picture ideas with respect to uh, particular things that could be um, appreciated by the students. So let's talk about why do humans not have a lot of hair and use that to talk about evolution. Let's talk about celiac disease, to talk about the digestive system, right? So um, making things accessible through particular targets. And so down here, um, we talk about uh, the pre-survey and the idea early on in the first few weeks of the class, um, emphasizing that for any phenomenon, there are multiple plausible alternative explanations and experimental controls are valuable. So they're not being subtle about this. This is, you know, this is a very important thing that, that they are bringing into the class in terms of the way they are offering it. And when you look down here, you get the um, approach of how they are actually uh, looking at the class or how they're actually presenting this information. And so just focusing on the whales and evolution example here. So talking about uh, the traits that whales have, thinking about what they have in common with other groups, and then uh, using that to discuss what they know about where whales come from and how we can um, eliminate particular variables or non-variables in terms of placing whales in the hierarchical order of evolution. So uh, the active learning approach comes from the small group discussions they're doing um, with, these with these opportunities in class. And so down here with the lactose intolerance they do the same things, um, thinking about what the ramifications of their observations are, thinking about other ways to explain them, and then consciously thinking about ways they could try to rule one out versus another. So a very deliberate approach um, to be able to think about these things. And if I go further down here in the next uh, appendix, you actually see the very specific questions uh, that they've offered to the um, group, as well as an actual uh, piece of reading they can do uh, to give them some ideas here as well. 
So again, it looks good. Um, I would have liked to have seen some of this in the paper. <laughs> I know that they have uh, limitations in what they're allowed to say, but it was weird reading about an intervention where the intervention wasn't explained. So I, I, this was important enough. A lot of times I like to be able to get away without going through the supplemental material, but I, you couldn't help it this one uh, to bring it up and show it to you guys. Yeah, so, I'm surprised they didn't at least have one figure to I give know, you an right? example of each of so I could get yeah. my head wrapped around what were you, tr what were you trying to do for intervention? That's exactly what I was thinking. Like you couldn't put in a table or something. Yeah. Uh, so actually, now that you've seen that, um, are there ways that you guys approach this stuff in your own classes? Maybe not so explicitly, but um, are there sort of parallel things you do to introduce your students to the way um, they should think about these sorts of questions? I know. I know from my example in uh, in my plant pathology class. Yeah. Um, early on, we talk about the uh, late potato blight in the Irish potato famine. That's a good one. And, and at the time, there, you know, people didn't know is the fungus happen after the potatoes are sick or is the fungus the causative agent? And so the, the founder of plant pathology, a guy named Anton DeBerry, he actually was famous at the time for taking because they thought, well, it's cold, wet conditions. Maybe that is what causes the disease. <clears throat> and so he took healthy potatoes, put them in cold, wet conditions. Another group of healthy potatoes, put them in cold, wet conditions. One he exposed the actual sick potatoes to, one he didn't. And of course, it turned out the ones that he exposed the sick potatoes to also got late potato blight. And so then I asked the students, like, that is that was his major finding at the time, which we think of as relatively silly today. And what's that called? And most of them, they're like, yeah, obviously he's doing the control. You have to do the control part of that experiment. And so um, I never, I, I never even occurred to me. I just did it because I thought it was kind of fun. That was his big claim to fame, but it didn't occur to me like from this paper that so many people don't even, don't seem to appreciate the value of controls. And so it made me think maybe I should further reinforce that just a little bit more to make sure everyone's on board with, uh, with the value of that, why that's important. Yeah, I have, um, so one of the things that I, I had a grant a few years ago to make um, these activities that are called interactive video vignettes. Mm -hmm. These are online um, activities that they do um, where there's like a scenario, uh, typically, you know, some undergraduates trying to solve some kind of a problem and they do an experiment and the student kind of goes along with them and looks at the data and whatever. Um, but one of the things that we built into those purposefully was talking about controls um, because of course they're doing experiments. Um, and I find that the students are, are often like commenting about that they learned something about why we do controls from the, those videos. So like the videos were intended to teach the content more of like, so for example, we have one that's about, um, you know, the idea that the mutation happens before the evolution, right? So we, we have uh, before natural selection occurs on it. So we have um, an, at, an experiment where they're looking at bacteria on plates and determining whether they're antibiotic resistant or not. And the, the student in the, the scenario is trying to, to clone um, a plasmid with an antibiotic resistance gene. And she gets you know a few colonies on her plate and she tries to sequence them and can't find their, their plasmid. It's like, well, why can't she find it? Well, those were just spontaneous mutants. They didn't actually have the, the plasmid in them but she didn't do the control to figure that out. And so like, there are things like that built in. Um, and I think that's really helpful for them to like really, and we ask them questions about the control, like what control does she need to do to figure out what, why, she, you know, what's going on here. And I think that's really helpful for them. They don't often like, when we do stuff in lab, we often make them do a control, but because the lab is kind of done well, they don't, the, lab, the control never fails and they don't really know why they did the control. So like um, recently I, I had some students setting up PCRs and 
um, this one group, like they ran out of mix um, to go and make the last two, which would be their control. And they're like, well, can you just give us more mix and more primers and more everything? And I'm like, what's the point of that? That doesn't tell me if you're, if you contaminated your master mix, you know, if I give you a, a fresh tube, like that never occurred to them that there was like a, you know, we're testing something specifically by, by using the same exact um, tube that we used to begin with. Yeah, thank you for that example. That's Sheila, uh, welcome. Hey. Yeah, sorry about that. No worries. The world of Zoom. <laughs> I think we need to have four Zoom accounts and do it the way we would naturally do it. But um, <laughs> I thought this paper was interesting. I had not read this paper before. Uh, I do read the GMB articles, but uh, it was very interesting. And uh, I teach uh, anatomy and physiology as well as microbiology. I teach at Wabanzi Community College. So it's mm -hmm. right in the middle of the prairie in Illinois. So um, one way that I have used something similar, it's not exactly uh, with a case study because ours are more case study derived. So for example, uh, I would give them three scenario case studies of uh, understanding osmosis. And you would think osmosis is not a big deal, but when you think about renal physiology, 100% of renal physiology is all understanding osmosis and then understanding osmolarity versus dissociation constant and how when sodium chloride breaks down, you get two and calcium, you know, all of those ionic numbers are so important. So when I give them a case study, I would ask the student, I say, um, design something where you could have an alternative experiment to prove the same answer, you know? Mm -hmm. So for example, if I had sodium chloride inside a sac and then a higher molarity of sodium chloride outside, if you wanted to show that the cell was shrinking or the cell was expanding, how would you design that case study, right? So I give them one, they have to design the corollary of that. And then the second one would be, so that would be level one. So I would call that as beginner's level. And mm -hmm. if they got, through that, then they'd go to the intermediate level where the sac would have glucose and then outside would be sodium chloride. So now they have to first think about what's happening and then design a corollary of that experiment. And if they finish intermediate, then they go to advanced where they would have calcium chloride inside and then sodium chloride outside. And now, what they learned in the beginning and in the intermediate, the logic doesn't apply to the third one for figuring out the hypotheses. And it's been very interesting to see how students just don't even think, they just write the answer. Yeah. I mean, they're just looking yeah. at the numbers, they're looking at, and they just draw the arrow, they write the answer, they design the next experiment. And I'm like, what? <laughs> well, so thank you. They, yeah. So. Yeah, these are really good. Uh, these are really insightful um, examples. I really appreciate you guys sharing these. Um, it also shows we've been thinking, you know, despite this paper, um, we've been thinking about this thing a little bit independently ourselves too, right? About uh, how we can uh, best present these ideas. And if we're seeing things that clearly and obviously people are blowing past, how can we um, address those in our own classes? So these are excellent suggestions. So now bringing it all back around, now we bring in the uh, actual intervention here. And so we're looking at the um, pre-test and post-test about um, the drug. And now we are looking at it from the open-ended assessment. And so um, we're able to get some more information about what um, people are actually thinking about. And what you see here in A through D, um, they are able to code some of these answers and also look at the ability of the students to uh, ignore the high percentage, right, as the distractor, as you see there in D. And so we're going to break these down by the R1 school majors and non-majors, as well as by what happens overall at the PUI. And there's not a lot of statistical significance here, but there is a lot of fairly 
just noteworthy, just by the eyeball, um, seeing increases in what is occurring. So when looking at the um, identifying the need for a control group, the R1 non-majors class does in fact show a significant uptick in the number of students who are doing that. And again, I actually misspoke. So we're not looking at the intervention here yet. We're just simply looking at the open-ended responses. So um, pre to post, we are getting more people recognizing the need for a control group um, across the board, but most significantly in the R1 non-majors group. Um, you'll notice significantly in these, um, all four of these graphs, the PUI group is um, lagging behind in terms of the expected answers. Um, this gets to um, the difference probably in the preparedness to some extent, the demographics of what you're seeing in these student populations that was deliberately set up. So that could be considered. And so you are seeing that manifest itself in these results. So there are some differences when I eyeball this, I can see them, right? But by and large, you're not seeing significant differences without the intervention in terms of what's being seen. Okay, now we go back. <laughs> now we do the intervention. And what do we see in terms of a control versus a not control? And what's exciting for them is that they do in fact seem to have a difference when they're looking at the intervention group. Now notice that it's still not an epically large number. Like we had what? 10% of the population um, show the appropriate answer over on the left in the post-test. And on the right, it has now gone up to a quarter. So is there still ground to be made up there? Sure, but they absolutely got a bunch of people who stopped thinking it was effective automatically. So clearly there was a shift based on the way they were presenting things. And remember from what you just saw in the um, explicit results, um, or sorry, from the uh, intervention description, they're being very explicit in telling you, okay, alternative responses, right? And so you're seeing that idea pull itself out here. Um, I should point out, this is the PUI results you're looking at specifically. So the intervention does seem to be having an effect <laughs> Um, it's not shifting everyone over to the appropriate answer, but it's getting people to question um, without any other information. Oh, clearly it's effective because it's a high number. You think it's, what do you guys think of the fact that the other wrong answer is even more common? Like they, they shifted from like, I don't know, less than 10% saying not effective to that being the most common answer. And that's also a wrong answer. I wonder if it's because um, after a whole semester of being told about alternative answers, there's sort of almost a bias of assuming, oh, this has to be wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking too, is that it's so much for them saying, don't know wasn't, they thought that you could say that it's wrong because you don't have all the information perhaps. Mm -hmm. And we were just taught that you have to have all the information to make your conclusion or it's not effective if you don't have all the information because you can't say. That's kind of what I was, I was kind of guessing from, from that aspect of it. But yeah, it was, I was kind of surprised looking at that too, as to, hmm, it's almost uh, if, that's, if that's why they picked that answer, then that would be an even stronger argument that, that this was an effective intervention, right? Like, so it would be useful, I think, to interview students at this point and find out if they picked the answer they did. Yeah, an open-ended follow-up as to why on that would have been really nice to see. Is that is what we were thinking true or not? Yeah, I totally agree. Because in my osmosis example, yeah, uh, many students pick the right answer. Um, but when we have a case study where they have to explain, based on that, they have to think about the proximal convoluted tubule and explain how that reabsorption happens. They didn't understand that. They, it is like intuitive. It was almost like driving. Like, you know, they just said, yeah, this is right. But they didn't know why it was right. And I think there is a problem when you don't know why something is right because 
then when you ask that question in different ways, then you don't get the right answer again and again. And you can't teach it back as a peer tutor. Yeah. So they they knew it was right, but didn't know why it was right. Yes. Yeah. So here's your intervention comparison now. So we're going to look at is a drug effective? And we're doing this with the open-ended assessment as before. And now you are seeing in three of the four categories, some significant difference in what is seen pre to post with the intervening students. So they don't get a lot of traction in terms of a significant number of students specifically saying we need a control group. That said, um, you've got confounding factors which are significantly increased. This I think probably has to do with the vocabulary, right? I found one of the things about this particular paper is that they kept interchanging control and confounders. And so this probably speaks to how they were talking in the class. Um, that clearly states uncertainty. And so you see that, and then they're less apt to be fooled by the high percentage. So besides not actually explicitly saying the word control, they seem to get the idea of the need for some control variable present. And now we look at the everyday life scenario, the fluffy eggs or whatnot, and you do get a little bit of a different result than what you saw before. So if I compare pre and post, um, even without the intervention, you actually did get a bunch of people that got squirrely about whether the, uh, in, the treatment was effective or not. And so you get a bunch of people switch over to ineffective, you have some switching over to not knowing. Um, the results, repeats itself over in the intervention group. So this actually brings up a, a pretty interesting twist on the results in that they are seeing in the everyday life scenario, basically a self-correction that when it's not, I think Nick, you said this, when it's not an explicitly scientific thing, um, that there seems to be a better appreciation for uh, relative effectiveness or non-effectiveness. So that tweak is an intriguing one because it shows that the intervention really wasn't necessary here. That just sort of happened by taking the class. Uh, um, this, so is this game playing? Like um, students do that with multiple choice tests, right? They, they try to um, figure out like play some sort of game to figure out what the right answer should be rather than actually knowing the content, but actually just by looking at the way the question was phrased or like what they know about the, the so like if they're, if they've been in a class with this person for a semester and this person is always giving them questions where the answer is, I don't know. Whereas before when they first came to the class, you should never answer I don't know on a test, but now this person is training you that I don't know is okay. Even if it's not specifically about, you know, um, understanding controls, you know, is, is this a psychological effect rather than of, of the way that this person teaches and the way that students try to gain the test? That's really interesting. Yeah, for me, I almost looked at along similar lines as I look at particularly the the uh, the posts of either intervention or control. Is that it seemed like yeah, there's some differences, but it basically then the class basically just like is almost like randomly like effective, not effective, don't know, or not that far apart from each other. It's almost like they just have no idea of what you should be doing. They just randomly guessed as one of the three, which I was kind of confused by as to. It's hard for me to visualize that from the data as to what's going on in their minds, you know what I mean, of why they picked those different answers. <clears throat> I'm going to keep going down here. Um, 
your open-ended assessment on is the product effective. So you get those changes, but you'll see in B and in C, you get them in both the control and the intervention group. In this particular example, you do in fact get the word control spit out by an appreciable uh, number of people. And although the interesting, here, the interesting thing here is the number actually goes the opposite direction where you think it might go. Uh, it's actually significantly fewer people identify the need for a control group. So there's certainly some interesting stuff going on here when you sort of take it out of the straight up scientific scenario in the fact that you're working with the same groups of people, but you're getting really pronounced different results um, in terms of how they are receiving this particular information. I was just thinking, um, is it possible that these students are also taking like chemistry or something and they're learning it there? Huh. I mean, this isn't being done in a vacuum, right? So. right? This is something that all science should be doing, should be teaching them. And I was also thinking that maybe correlating what they are actually seeing to another uh, result, like an improvement in course grade or an improvement in that scientific hypothesis testing module, or maybe a subsequent course, which has got some higher level thinking would actually determine if any of these changes, as we see, is long lasting, or it is just a blip, right? Yeah. Or it could be instructor bias too, because um, I did an intervention um, where I taught students what would be high impact study skill strategies. And eventually over a period of time, they realized that this instructor likes this kind of high impact study strategies. And she's always talking about breaking down concepts. She's always talking about diagramming. She's always talking about concept maps. So maybe that's why they picked all of those in their, in their self-evaluated choices. Amy, you know what you want to hear. Yeah. yeah, I thought it would have been kind of neat. <clears throat> I know it would take a lot of extra coding, but if they could ask the students to make up your own scenario, which illustrates why you picked one of these reasons, why this agrees with your thought process, to, so you could see a little bit more is, is, do they have, are they coming to the right answer for the wrong reason or not? Right. But I know coding that would be a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think that's, ah, yes. And so you get the coding of the, um, actually what is a control data. Um, I wanted to notice right here at the bottom, uh, controls eliminate alternative explanations. So yeah, since they harped on that so much, that's the least shocking thing you see in the entire paper. That goes from zero to two thirds. So they clearly got their point across in that respect. Um, by and large here, pre versus post, um, you get some sense of variation. Interestingly enough, fewer people think it's a comparison um, when I go pre to post. Um, more people think they're, um, they're knowns in the, uh, at least when I look at the uh, control group. So, oh, I'm reading that wrong. I'm sorry. Controls are comparisons. Fewer people in the control pre to post course thought they were comparisons and it did increase in the intervention. I feel a little better about that then. I'd read that when I was going through that very quickly. Um, controls being constant and not changing, um, that's roughly a wash too. So they get some interesting data here. Clearly they got across the point they wanted to get across, which was about the alternative explanations. So their line of thinking clearly was well received in the uh, particular group. And then you see here those same ideas uh, describing cause and effect, controls accounting for confounding variables, controls or comparisons, but no significant uh, results there. Yeah, I kind of thought one of my take home messages was is that I probably should spend a little bit more time explaining controls just in general, just to make sure that um, for me, I mean, it seems you know blatantly obvious that you should have controls, but 
you know, maybe just my one example or whatever for the class is not enough. Maybe when I do some real data of other things, ask them like, what's the, what was the appropriate control for this? And what's it really controlling for? Instead I do agree with that. That's something I hadn't thought about as being a big issue, but this paper suggests it certainly is. So yeah. Uh, Sheila, can I have you comment on what you wrote in the chat there about the focus groups? So I was thinking, for example, if um, a student picked altern this X number or choice, why did they pick that? So in a qualitative approach, they would actually get some students to sit down and the we would brainstorm about, you know, you don't, you don't really ask them why they picked that, but you have a series of questions sort of leads you to come to an understanding about why they picked that. Yeah. And then code from that qualitative piece. And that would tell what uh, Nick and Dina were talking about is that, did they really understand or they just sort of guessed it and uh, somehow continued to guess it because through their classroom, experience or they were getting data from another class maybe there was a chemistry class or another lab class that really got the control idea to them really well right and that would uh, resolve that question that uh, dina raised about are they getting it elsewhere which is pretty yes, interesting, yes. I think. So, yeah but i think this qualitative work is uh, mind-boggling probably <laughs> <laughs> Because first, you have to give these students $25 gift card to be part of the focus group. <laughs> That's exactly. one. So where are you exactly. going to get that money from? And then yeah. you have to have it videotaped, get them to do a consent. And then you have to transcribe the videotape. And then before you transcribe them, you must have some code already generated to see if it aligns. If they say this word, then what does that mean? And if they say the sentence, what does that mean? Yeah. Oh besides, besides that, it's easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe that's uh, their next work. They have University of Chicago working with them. They could get some grad students to do. This. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty. Well. I think another question about um, why they saw the, the difference in their control group is that their prompts are not exactly the same. Um, I was just looking at the appendix to see what their prompts were. And the everyday life prompt, it feels different to me. I don't know. I think it feels like the first one would be easier to, to dismiss the control than the second. Yeah. So left unspoken here, because we, I don't know if you're familiar with the EDAT, the experimental design assessment, we run into a similar problem with there that you get these very specific prompts, and you could argue about the quality of the prompt itself can lead to more ambiguity or less ambiguity, depending on the one you're using. And so yeah, I wouldn't dismiss that at all as a possibility here. What is EDAT? Exper experimental design assessment test. And so it's a prompt and then a prompt to design an experiment. And then there is a 10 point scale that is used to uh, basically to give the quality of the uh, experiment that's laid out. It's, it's okay. <laughs> um, it works as a blunt instrument. It's got, if you wanna work with it at a more refined level, it's got some issues to it. Yeah, and I, I think one thing they could do to um, address that issue is you give half the students one prompt first and you give the other half the other prompt first yeah and then um, you make sure that they get the opposite prompt for their post test um, but then you can be sure that it's it's not just the prompt but it's it's the learning and I think that EDAP people did that um, yeah all right. I need to go to my next Zoom meeting now. So it's one of those days. But um, I really appreciate you. Oh, yes, Sheila. I was also thinking ESL at our community college. We oh, are, well, yes. We are a rural uh, first-gen Hispanic-serving college. 
and it's so important to for them to really for us to see that they understood the question the way it is supposed to be yeah and that is um, what they they acknowledge the demographics but don't really go anywhere yes. with it so that's a great point yeah because you could say the word implied and then by mm -hmm. some of the students say the way i studied implied in my country was different so there's certainly some potentially good information here that maybe simply needed to be presented or considered with some different groups and you'd get a little more information out of it. It's a good point. All right. I'll let well, you go. Yeah. On that note, no, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. That's actually really important to bring up. All right, but thank you guys very much. Yeah, um, thanks, Rose. It's Mike. Good to see you, Dean, and she. Yeah, and good to see you. I'll see you at our next time. Right, bye. Bye. -bye. bye.